If you'd like to open to 1 John chapter 1, we're going to begin 1 John chapter 1 this morning. Now, I know that you've never been like me, and you've never been one of those people who's looking all around, maybe kind of frantic, and, uh, and you know, where, where are my glasses? And you look, and you look, and then there they are, right? Or worse, right here, right? Where are my glasses? I, I remember... I used to wear contacts, and several years ago, I was uh, looking for my glasses, and I looked all over the house. I probably spent 30 minutes trying to find my glasses, finally found them, and I put them on, and I realized I've been wearing my contacts the whole time. <laughs> and so I, I could see, I, it didn't help me find my glasses very well, but I could see. Or, you know, you've never been that person, right, of where, where is my phone? And you're, you're searching everywhere and everywhere, right? and it's just right here in your hand, isn't it? That, all that time. And so... That, that's sort of the idea that 1 John 1, 1 through 4 is about, is, is having something right there with you and somehow missing it, just, just being oblivious to it, even though it's, it's just right there. And so, you know, really, I think the way that John paints the picture is sort of the idea of holding kind of a glass of water. And it's not just any glass of water. It's a glass of water that's overflowing. It's got some kind of, you know, motor in it and it just continuously flows. And so you're holding water in your hand, and it's constantly spilling on your hand, but somehow you've forgotten. And you, you didn't notice that the water is there in your hand, constantly spilling. That's the idea. Notice First John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare, declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. And so John writes to a people who have, he says, eternal life, fellowship with the Father, a full joy, like a cup of water that's just overflowing in their hand, but they've gotten so distracted that they've kind of forgotten to take notice of it. And he encourages them, you know enough already to have confidence. You know that because of the message. You know that because of the promise. And the message and the promise give you confidence in the fellowship of Christ and in the joy of Christ. And so this morning, I'd like to consider what John says, and first of all, that you can be confident in the message and in the promise of Christ. This is very much the idea of John 14, 23. If you notice John uh, chapter 14 and verse 23, John 14 and verse 23, Jesus uh, answers and says to Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other Judas, he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And so this is sort of a marker that Jesus gives, you know, and that's the church is marked by several things. One of the things it's marked by, Jesus says, is our love for one another. But the other thing that marks it is our love for the Father, for, for the Son. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And the evidence of loving the Father and the Son is, is obedience to the Father and the Son. But he continues and says, and my Father will love him and we will come to him and we will make our home with him. And so he says, he has given us a word. And that's, John is going to talk a lot about the word. You know, John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word uh, was with God, and the word was God, and the word w uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. John talks a lot about the word and the message that Jesus brought to us. And he says, if you really trust that message, if you really have confidence in that message, then you will obey that message and show how much you love it how much you love the Son, how much you love the Father. And so uh, uh, he, he encourages them to recognize that they can be confident in the message and also in the promises that come with that message. Now in 1 John chapter 1, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, he uses, and really even into verse 3, he uses a lot of what you might call sensing words. And so uh, to hear something, to see something, to touch something with your hands. Uh, he's talking about the five senses. He uses a lot of sensing words. There are actually eight distinct sensing words in this section. 
And so it maybe doesn't seem like it at first because he seems to repeat some of them, you know, that he looked upon this and he saw that, and we think, well, that's all just talking about sensing with the eyes, right? But those are actually distinct words, and some of them have to do with just a glance. You know, we, we saw him go by. Others have to do with a very intense stare to, to look very closely until you just really understand it. And so he says, we, we saw him. We saw him casually. We, we dwelt our eyes upon him to behold all that he is. We heard him. We heard a little bit of what he said. But also we listened very intently to really understand all that he is. He says, we touched him with our hands. And that's, you think back to Thomas. I remember Thomas says, you know, I, I won't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead unless I can touch it myself. And so Jesus says, okay. And Thomas touches the holes from the nails. He touches the, 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 the hole in his side. He touches the evidence that Jesus had died and then risen from the dead. And that's what John is talking about here. And he says, we have seen and heard and touched, first, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, a reminder of Jesus being eternal, seeing and touching and hearing the Son of God who had always been and will always be, something special, something worth paying attention to, known completely by John. You know, you think about that. Jesus, like all people, uh, had friends, and he had a, a lot of disciples, but he chose to make 12 of those disciples his particular friends. He spent the most time with them. And of the 12 disciples, he singled out three of them, Peter and Andrew and John, to be even a little bit closer to, sort of an inner circle that were his best of friends. But in the Gospel of John, we we're told over and over again that John is the disciple whom he loved. And I, I think kind of the idea there is, even of the three friends, Jesus and John were best friends. You know, if Jesus had a BFF, it was John the Apostle, right? And so he, uh, he was particularly close to John. He maybe spent more time with John than anyone. And so John writes to us here, and this is, this is not John the Baptist, this is John the Apostle, uh, writing first John, and he's saying, I, when Jesus walked this earth, was really just the very best friend that Jesus had. I knew him better than anyone probably. And so what I say about him, you can know that it's true. Now there's other reasons we can know it's true. John was an apostle. And so Jesus said in, in John 14, 15, and 16 that he would send the Holy Spirit to the apostles so that they could remember everything Jesus has said. And so John is inspired by the Holy Spirit. What he says is certainly from God. And so we know that that makes it true but more than that, John has something just a little bit more because he was just so very close to Jesus. And so he says, whatever I say here, you can know that it's true. And he says in verse 1, Jesus is the word of life. He knew Jesus the man very, very well. He says, I know the word of life, the message that that man brought that brings us life. I know that message completely. 1 John is one of the very last books of the Bible that was ever written. And so by the time that he writes it, pretty much everything that the apostles are going to say has already been said. Uh, there's, there's really, 1 John doesn't add anything new doctrinally. It doesn't teach us anything new about uh, uh, how to be saved or how to live a godly life. Now, certainly it has a lot of value. It, it encourages us and helps us. It doesn't add anything that wasn't previously known by the Christians at this point. And so he says he knows completely the message that Jesus intends, just like they could all know it as well, and he's sharing that with them. And then in verse 2, he calls him the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And so with that, he reminds us of this promise. That there's the message that Jesus brought, and there's the promise that Jesus brought, a promise that we can dwell with God forever, a promise that we can uh, end our separation that sin causes from God and have a relationship with God in this lifetime, have a nearness and a closeness to God in our daily walk and to, to go on to a place that God dwells in in the next life that never ends and the blessings never stop and the joys never come to. And so he says he knows that promise completely. 
Now he'll tell us later that his, writer, er, his readers, the people who are reading 1 John, are distracted by the voices around them telling them that they need to earn their salvation, that there are things they need to do in order to prove to God that they deserve salvation, that they should have a place in heaven. And he says they're distracted by that, and that's how they can have it, and it can be overflowing in their hand. But they're listening to these voices, and it causes them to forget what they're holding in their hand, all that water spilling on them. He says that they're distracted by that, but they don't have to be. And so when they have doubts, and I think his message for us today is, when you have doubts, when I have doubts about my salvation, we can ask these questions first. Have I obeyed the gospel as the apostles taught it? And notice in particular Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 and 20. Paul also talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 and 20. In Ephesians 2 and verse 19, Paul is, Paul is writing about uh, the church in Ephesus, and there are some Gentiles and some Jews there, and they're having trouble getting along. Paul is reminding them that Christ brought them together, and so they should get along. And he says in verse 19, he says, Now therefore, Ephesians 2, 19, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers, not He's talking specifically about the Gentiles, but really it's anyone who has been lost in sin. This is what he's saying about them. Though one time you were, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. You have a home in God's kingdom. He says you're members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, uh, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. And so Paul says there, Jesus gave us the, the cornerstone. He gave us, now a cornerstone is that block that every other piece of the foundation is modeled after. It has to match it perfectly in every possible way. And so he says, Jesus gave us the perfect model, but he gave the apostles the responsibility of duplicating it and of, of growing it so that he has a firm foundation. And so if you are looking at what the apostles say, and building your life off of that, you are building your life off of the foundation that Jesus intended you to have. And so whenever we doubt our salvation, the first question we ask is, is my foundation the same foundation that the Apostle Paul had? Is my foundation the same foundation that the Apostle Paul and the other apostles, John, would have taught me to have? And the apostles were all very consistent. They all had really one thing to say about salvation. Now there's Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, and there's Peter the Apostle. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter the Apostle gives us a piece of that foundation. He says, first of all, to repent. And that's, uh, you know, recognizing sin. Knowing. That's what the men there said. Peter had told them about their sin. And it says they were cut to the heart. They felt it deep, stabbed down in their soul. How could I have done this? How could I have separated myself from God like this? Cut to the heart, they say, what shall we do? And the first thing Peter says is, repent. See that sin in your life, how God sees it, and desire to change it, and then take action, whatever you have to do, in order to change that sin. Related to that, the Apostle Paul will tell us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, he'll tell us, that we are saved by confession, the idea of confession in who God is and who Jesus is, that by making a public confession with our mouth, uh, much like the, the eunuch does in Acts chapter 8, by making a public confession both with our mouth and then, generally speaking, with our lives day to day, that Jesus is the Son of God, that we trust that he came from God to save our souls and therefore to be our Lord. And that's, Jesus says, uh, as he ascends into heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew uh, 28 and verse 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so if he has all authority, then really we submit to him whether we choose to or not. In the end, we will, but we can choose it today by making that public confession. And then the apostles all agree. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter says to be baptized for the remission of sins, to be lowered into that water so that God will wash your sins away and raised again to new life. Peter says that in Acts 2.38. He also says it in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, when he says that, that just as Noah was saved by water, we are also saved by water. That when we are, uh, he says, baptism, 
now saves us. And, and so that's a part of God's plan to save us. He says it's not, not so much about the flesh, right? We are actually doing the baptism because God says so. But when we do that, God is washing our conscience, a good, clean conscience that's answering the call that God gave. And so he washes that conscience clean. That's what Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22 describes. He washes the conscience clean with the blood of Christ. And Paul says the same thing. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that baptism is not a work of man. And, and that's sometimes we hear people say that, that baptism is a work that we do and therefore it's not a part of salvation. But Paul says it's not a work of man. He says baptism is a work of God. That when you submit to baptism, when you allow yourself to be baptized, right, someone else does all the work. They, they hold your weight. They lower you under. They lift you back up. When you allow yourself to be baptized, God does the work. He cleanses your soul. He makes you clean. And then Paul says also in Romans chapter 6, he says, if anyone is baptized into Christ, that person has raised with Christ. And that we need that death, that crucifixion, of the old man of sin. We need to be lowered into those waters, into that grave, just as Jesus was buried, and we need to be raised again to accept the salvation that God offers. And he says the same thing in Galatians chapter 3. The apostles agree. Salvation comes to those who repent of their sins and make a confession of who Jesus is and their desire to be his disciple, to, to discipline themselves to follow Christ wherever he goes, and then take that step into the waters to be raised again to new life. And so have I obeyed the gospel as the apostles taught it? If the answer is no, we should doubt our salvation. We should dig into that and, and ask questions and look and see what have the apostles said. But if the answer is yes, well, that's a good clue uh, to what First John is talking about. And second, he says, have I been promised eternal life with the Father and with Jesus? And if you have obeyed the gospel plan as the apostles have laid it out, then the answer to that is unequivocally, yes, you have been promised eternal life with the Father and with the Son. Now, he's going to explain that more in just a moment. But if you can answer yes to those two questions, then you can begin to know you have divine fellowship. The second thing we see in verse 3 is your confidence in that fellowship. And again, I want to point out John 14, 23 in relation to this. In John 14, 23, that's really what Jesus is talking about is divine fellowship. He says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my commands or the words that I have spoken. And if they do that, the Father and the Son both, he says, they'll come to you. They'll make their home with you. The idea of that is that you are the kind of person that the Father and the Son are able to have a relationship with, are comfortable being around, can, can help and grow and offer grace and mercy to, because you have accepted the grace and mercy that they offer. And so I'm afraid sometimes that that's where we kind of uh, miss some of this, is the ultimate point of what we are doing here is not salvation. Now, that's an essential part of it. We need the salvation. We're nothing without the salvation that God offers. But salvation is not the ultimate point of what we're doing. The ultimate point of what we're doing is divine fellowship, is a relationship with God. And I think sometimes we let ourselves slip into sort of a saved or not saved mindset of, well, if I'm saved, then I'm fine. That's all I really need to worry about. So now that I've received salvation, I don't really have to think about anything else. Well, you've missed the biggest part and the biggest blessing that comes with salvation if you do that. Or there's the reverse side of that, where sometimes salvation becomes such a concern that it's all we think about, and it's with worry and anxiety and fear. Am I doing enough to be saved? Am I sure that I'm saved? Am I, am I, am I checking all the boxes to be saved? And we get really caught up in, in trying to ensure our own salvation that we miss the point that the reason we are saved is so that we can walk with God in nearness, in closeness. And so he says in verse 3, 1 John chapter 1, in verse 3, he says, again describing 
uh, what he knows. He says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. John's not holding anything back. He's giving you all the information that you need. And he says that you also may have fellowship with us. And so really the idea of with us is with the apostles, and therefore, by extension, those who follow the apostles. And so the idea that he's bringing up here is with true believers, with those people who, who have obeyed the gospel as the apostles laid out, and who, who truly believe and are chasing after what God has offered. He says you can have fellowship with true believers, not if you can't hear what I'm saying. And, uh, and then he continues, and he says, and truly, our fellowship, the apostles, those who follow the apostles, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's really the ultimate point of what we are reaching for, is a relationship with them. Now, they're distracted by the voices around them, saying they need something more than Jesus, that there are, Jesus is a good starting point, but there are other sources or other places to go to find out information about what salvation is and how to obtain salvation and keep salvation. And John is reminding them that they can be confident through Jesus alone. There's nowhere else to go, not even yourself, to give you or ensure your salvation. Only Jesus can do that. And so we turn to him. When we turn to him, when we doubt our salvation, and we ask these questions, first of all, do I know of a sin that I need to confess and repent? Now, this is assuming that you have obeyed the gospel as the apostles laid out, and you can say yes to that question. The next question you ask yourself is, do I know of a sin that I need to repent of and uh, uh, confess? And that's when we say confess and repent, we're talking about 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. In 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the idea is you, you know there's something in your life that you need to change. You know there's something in your life that in either because you've been calloused and you've not cared until now, or because you just didn't know before this moment, but now you've discovered it, something that needs to change. He says it's, it's simple. Confess that to God. Tell him, this is how I've been messing up, and now I know it's wrong, or now I realize that I need to do something about it. Make whatever changes, repent, and break whatever changes are necessary in order to, to uh, get that sin out of your life. And then trust, he says, trust that God is faithful to cleanse your conscience, just as he did at your baptism, he continues to do, though. He is faithful. He's never fails to forgive when we do that. If the answer is yes, and that's when you think about Acts 22 and verse 16. In Acts 22 and verse 16, uh, we see Ananias talking to Paul, and he says, why do you wait? Arise. Now, there he's talking about baptism specifically. He says, arise and be baptized now. There's no point in delay. There's nothing else that, that, that can save you, and so this is what you need to do. But I think the principle applies to sin generally. If you know there's something in your life that needs to be changed, if the answer is yes, and then I would say, arise, make that change now. Let's do something about that, trusting that God's grace abounds. And that's Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. In Romans 6 and verse 1, really there he's talking about how we don't just give in to sin, trusting that God's grace abounds, because that's, not, that's backwards mindset. But the principle is still true. When we do fail, when we do sin, God's grace does abound, that he knows that. And that for those who are, are, are walking, as he's going to describe it, in the light, he applies his grace to them so that they can keep walking in the light, even sometimes if they aren't yet aware of their own sin. He applies that grace to them. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, John says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. That's what he wants for them, not to sin. But if anyone sins, right? John's a realist. He knows we're going to mess up sometimes. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that's Jesus was human. He knows what it means to be tempted. Now, he never failed like we do. 
but he still knows what it means to have the desire to sin and to give in to temptation. And because he never failed, he knows how to get us through that. That's the point of Hebrews 4. But also because he, nev- because he felt tempted, he sits at the Father's right hand and he says, you know, this person, they did fall, but look at how they're picking themselves back up. And maybe they don't even know they've fallen yet. Maybe they're still figuring that out. But, but they are still marching with you. They are still trying to follow after you. Let's continue to cleanse them. Let's forgive them of that. Someday they'll figure it out and they'll confess it to us. And they'll find that we have been cleansing them and forgiving them of that all this time. Because they are walking in my light. They are moving in that direction. And so if the answer is yes, take care of that. Trusting in God's grace, not in yourself, but in God's grace and his fellowship. If you're not sure, uh, do I do I know of a sin I need to confess and repent? Sometimes there are things we're not sure of, right? We've read something in scripture and we think, you know, maybe that's saying that what I'm doing is sinful, but I, I don't really fully understand what the Bible says about this yet. And so maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, I'm not really sure what to make of that yet. If you're not sure if what you're doing is sinful or not, trust, first of all, trust in your advocate that he sees your effort to do what's right, to notice it, to ask those questions, and that if you have failed there, he is still cleansing you of those sins. Trust in the grace that abounds, and then take some time to work those questions out. Right? Don't make rash decisions just because you're afraid of being in sin. Take time to work those things out. That's the idea of Romans 14 and verse 23. In Romans 14 and verse 23, he says that, uh, that sometimes we do things that are not of faith, We've done something that when we understand it better, we'll know there was nothing sinful about it. But when we did it, we weren't sure if it was sinful or not. Well, that thing becomes sin at that point because we didn't do it of faith. We didn't do it trusting in God or knowing for certain what is or isn't sin. And so, you know, maybe take a break from that thing if you can, if you're trying to figure that out. But trust that God is covering as you do that. That's Philippians 2, verse 12. In Philippians 2, 12, he says to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Work it out. Take the time to think it through and and decide what to do so that you can get to the point where you can say, yes, that was sin. I'm going to change it. Or no, it wasn't. It's okay to keep doing that. And then finally, if the answer is no, the key thing here is keep trusting in God's grace. When you put trust in yourself, that's 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Uh, If you trust in your own ability to stand, you will fall. Keep trusting in God's grace. Keep trusting in the advocate before the Father that he is helping you. And then just keep walking. You think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That we never want to be standing on our own uh, grace or our own mercy. We want to look to the Father even when we can't think of anything that we've done wrong and know we're only here because of what he did. And so we are grateful that he doesn't expect us to just suddenly be perfect because we've discovered the truth and that he is working out our salvation with us. And so when you have confidence in the fellowship, that's what gives you joy. And joy is really, it's the guardian. It's of the guardian of confidence and salvation. That's what he says in verse 4. Notice verse 4, he says, And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. And I think about First John chapter, sorry, John chapter 15. First John doesn't have 15 chapters, and so if your First John has 15 chapters, you might have a funny looking Bible. But John chapter 15, John chapter 15 and verse 10 in John 15, 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide or, or dwell or remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then in verse 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you. Now, sometimes we think of commandments as something that sort of holds us back, right? Commandments are something that take all the fun out of life. Commandments are something that, that uh, keep us from things that we might want to do otherwise. But he says that he has spoken these commandments to you, verse 11, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may remain full. When we really see God's word the way God sees it, we recognize a full joy, 
the greatest treasure and blessing and joy of this life comes by knowing God's word, trusting God's word, and following God's word. And so that's why it says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Now, literally, it says that our joy may be having been fulfilled. So what that means is that when we receive salvation, our joy was filled, that's overflowing, at that point in time. So you think back to the day that you were baptized. If you think back to the day that you were saved, right? That was a joyous day. You felt the burden lift off your shoulders. You, felt, you never felt like that before. And the reason you felt that way is because you were focused in that moment on God and on the gospel that God had given you, on the salvation that God had given you, on him cleansing your sins. And as much as you knew to focus on, you were focused on those good things and your joy was full. And the problem comes that we get removed from that day and we stop focusing on those things and begin to focus on the things of the world and the worries and distractions and concerns. And he says, by focusing on these things, notice what John has written about. He has written about that which was from the beginning, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He has written about his experiences with him, seeing him, hearing him, touching him. John is thinking about the Son of God and his relationship with him and all the good that came from that. And when he thinks about that, his joy is full. If he thinks about other things and forgets about that, he loses that joy. Your joy has already been fulfilled. I see so many Christians chasing joy, chasing the peace that surpasses contentment, chasing a, a lack of anxiety. Or I see Christians chasing those things and thinking, when am I ever going to have what the Bible describes? And John says, you already had it. It's like that cup. It's already there, overflowing and getting your hand soaking wet. But you're so distracted, you don't even notice it there anymore. You already have all of those things. If you'll just take the time to notice them, not to listen to the wrong voices in the world or the wrong voices in our head, the ones that steal the joy that guards you, but instead, then when you have doubt, to ask these questions first. Who can take my fellowship with God away from me? Is there, is there anyone who can take it away from me? John, or Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 28, John chapter 10 and verse 28, Jesus says that my Father, who has given them, that's the disciples, uh, has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. And that's actually verse 29. So now we're going to go back and read verse 28. It says, verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And then he says, My Father is even greater, and no one snatches them out of their hand. If you have obeyed the gospel as the apostles have laid it out, if you are walking in the light that Christ offers, he says you are there in his hand, and no one can take you out. That the Father, you're in his hand, no one can remove you. You are secure, and there's no human. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, right? He says, what shall we say about these things? He's convinced that there's life nor death. There's angels nor demons, principalities and powers. There's no human. There's no kings or presidents. There's no mothers or fathers or sisters or brothers or spouses. There's nobody who can take your uh, fellowship with God, your salvation, away from you. Except, of course, what Jude says in Jude verse 20 and 21. It says, keep yourself in the love of God. You can always walk away from what God offers you. But if you're the only one who can take your salvation away, then you don't have to question if someone else has taken it away. You know what's interesting about that? Is God powerful enough to take your salvation away? Certainly he is. But God doesn't even himself take your salvation away from you, and he never will. Now, you can reject it. You can walk away from it. You can leave it behind, and he will not make you take it with you. You can certainly lose your salvation, and the book of Hebrews says that in chapters 5 and 6. The book of Jude says that, uh, and there's a lot of other places besides. You can certainly lose it, but only if you have walked away from it. God never takes it from you. 
despite all of that power, what he wants more than anything, 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse, well, maybe 16 or somewhere right in there, it says he's long-suffering because he desires the salvation of all people. This is what God wants more than anything, for you to be saved so that he can be close to you. He, the Father and the Son, can come and make their home with you, to have a relationship with you. This is all that he wants. He won't take that salvation away from you. He'll let you walk away. And so, who can take my fellowship with God away? Only me. And the next question is, am I ready to give up my fellowship with God? Now, the Hebrews writer doesn't think you are. The Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39, Hebrews 10, 39, he says, we are not those who draw back to perdition. We are not those who give up our walk with God. Now, certainly, the Hebrews writer recognizes that we fail and sin sometimes. John recognizes that. That's why he says in chapter 2 and verse 1, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And so drawing back to perdition doesn't mean that you've stumbled and fallen one day. It doesn't mean that you have, uh, have never sinned since the day that you were saved. Drawing back to perdition means giving up, deciding, I know I have this sin in my life, and I'm going to keep coming to worship, and I'm going to keep doing all these things, and I know I have this sin in my life, but I'm just not concerned about that sin. I'm just going to let it be there. Or just giving up entirely and walking away and, and choosing not to be present with God's people and not to be present with God. He's talking about giving up. And so if you can answer the question, am I ready to give up my fellowship, up, uh, my fellowship with God with a no, then you know you still have your salvation. And really, if you think about it, if you're the kind of person that's concerned about losing your salvation, you're probably not the kind of person that is just going to give up and not have salvation. And so, you know, that's, that's a good question to ask. And it's a good question to ask. The Bible is full of people who doubt and then overcome that doubt. But you can have confidence. And that's why John writes in 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, he says in verse 13, 1 John 5.13, he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. This is why John wrote, You can know. You can be confident. Not, am I saved? Well, I sure hope I am. Am I going to heaven? Well, that sure sounds nice. I sure hope I'm going to heaven. I know I have salvation. Why do I know it? Well, I know that I have obeyed the gospel according to how the apostles laid it out. I know that he has promised me eternal life with the Father and the Son. I know that when I find sin in my life, I'm just going to deal with it. We're going to repent of it. We're going to get it out. And God continues to cleanse me and to wash me and to forgive me. And I know that if I just keep getting up and keep walking, even after I stumble, if I just keep moving in that right direction, maybe there's sin in my life that I don't even know about yet. I know that God's light is shining on me and that I am walking in the right direction, studying and growing, applying, embodying, being what Christ intended me to be. And that because of that, I have not walked away from it yet. And if I haven't walked away from it, the Bible says nobody else can take it away and God won't take it away. So if I haven't walked away from it, I have salvation. And I have something bigger than that. I have fellowship with God. Replace the voices with John's voice. And I think that's what he wants. All the voices in your head that make you doubt, kick them out and put John's voice in your head, what he says in verses 1 through 4, and make that the voice that tells you whether or not you have salvation or not. Look down. See that cup in your hand. 
how it's overflowing with joy. And take comfort. Are you perfect? No. First John 1 John 1.8 says, John, does not, he knows you're not perfect, and if you think you are, you've missed something. Do you recognize every single time you sin? First John 1 John 1.7 says, no. You won't even know it every single time you sin. Have you given up? If the answer is yes, certainly you have cause for concern, and that's what Hebrews 10.26 says. If you have given up, that's cause for concern. But if the answer is no, you have fellowship with God. I want to notice one last verse this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. In 2 Timothy 3.14, Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy was a man who was relatively young and uh, probably a very timid person. He had a lot of doubts of his own that he struggled with. And Paul encourages him in 1 Timothy 3.14. He says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned. Now, Timothy was written a long time before John, but even then, Paul says, John, or Timothy knows enough. He knows what he needs to know. He says, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Timothy knew that he was taught correctly. Now, if we discover that we weren't taught correctly and we haven't obeyed the gospel according to how the apostles laid it out, that's a different story. If we discovered that we weren't taught correctly and maybe our salvation was true, but that we've been sinning and not knowing, we have to change. Knowing is not a word. Knowing, we have to change that. But if we know that we have a good foundation, then we just continue in those things which we have learned. And we are assured of those things which we have learned. And he says in verse 15, that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, and this is what they do. They are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that's why he says, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction and instruction in righteousness. We're not perfect, and we'll always have things to change and grow in, but it's profitable for those things so that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This morning, we all in here should be able to say, based on the evidence that John gives us, I know or I don't know. If you know, take comfort. That's the wonderful gift that God gives us. If you don't know, today is the time to figure something out and to ask questions, seek help, dig deep and find the answer to that question because we are not promised another hour we are not promised another day and we never know when our time may come or when the lord jesus christ himself might descend from heaven with flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know god and who have not obeyed the gospel of our lord jesus christ second thessalonians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 and so if we can help you with anything please Come forward now as we stand and sing.